Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. The son of a physician and with a penchant for math, Andy Redleaf came upon options in high school even before they were listed on the CBOE. Post-college, he landed in an option trading role and was making markets on the CBO during the 87 crash. In his rendering, the introduction of stock index futures dramatically increased correlation and the creation of portfolio insurance left some investors short a put that no others were long. In combination, this left the market vulnerable to such a sharp one-day plunge. Our conversation considers market stress periods in the context of the neat mathematical models and their simplifying assumptions that may be enablers of these seismic events. We talk as well about Andy's hedge fund career, first co-founding Deephaven and then founding Whitebox. Both ventures were focused on exploiting mispricings in complex securities such as converts and the relative value between equity and corporate credit securities. As the head of Whitebox for two decades, Andy oversaw the firm's expansion into a global multi-strat hedge fund that traded all asset classes and through periods of vol both high and low. Our discussion brings to life the instability that Andy saw lurking beneath the surface of calm markets in the period preceding the financial crisis. He shares his analysis of the wholesale mispricing of mortgage credit risk that was evident in the statistic that nearly 90% of the refinancings on New Century's book increased the amount owed from the original mortgage amount. This, Andy suggests, is an indication of a more desperate borrower. As we explore the important risk events that have helped shape his risk philosophy, we also pivot to the financial climate that is today. Andy is skeptical that low interest rates are stimulative and sees the decline in interest income as a consumption headwind for consumers who are trying to reach a specific financial goal through savings. Today, Andy is principal of Park Financial Group, a firm finding opportunities to prudently lend in today's climate of highly bifurcated credit allocation. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Andy Redley. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Andy Redleaf. He is the principal of Park Financial Group and a gentleman that has seen many market wars over many years, founded two hedge funds. Andy, thanks for taking the time. It's great to have you on the podcast today. My pleasure. So why don't we get into the early days of your career? My understanding is you spent some time in the 80s trading options on the CBOE. Lots of change over the course of the last... 30 plus years at markets, some seismic events in terms of volatility. Well, tell us about how you got started in finance. What attracted you initially to markets? And then maybe specifically, how did you get started in the derivative space? There's a fair amount of serendipity in my career. and In fact, sort of 40, 45 years ago, the world was just such a different place. I mean, I was always, I was an enterprising kid. My little creepy crawlers in fourth grade, that was my first business that I remember. But my father was a physician. I sort of expected that I would do the same thing. I was pretty sure I could do that. He made a nice living. It seemed interesting. So when I went off to college, I expected to major in physics and become a doctor. Turned out when I got to college, turned out that I really liked math and I didn't really like physics. And it was really the product of my high school education. I went to a high school that had a very unusual math program in that in eighth grade, big project was proving 80 theorems. And so for, you know, kind of five years of high school math, it was taught axiomatically and it was taught kind of the way academic mathematicians think. When I got to college, it wasn't that I was smarter than other people interested in math. It was more that I had kind of five years of experience. I turned out to be really good at that. And my principal high school math teacher was sort of a stickler for logical precision. And it was just sort of anathema to me when I took physics that they made all these unstated assumptions and sort of just bothered me. You were supposed to be very explicit about all your underlying assumptions and so forth. So I liked math. I didn't like physics and I was better prepared than people around me. So I did well at it. I 
I expected to become an academic mathematician. You know, at the, this is the mid 70s. The buy side of the finance industry didn't, for all practical purposes, didn't exist. There weren't really careers in finance. I'm not sure that the word finance, if you said that, then what meaning it would have. So I was interested in the math behind my father. As I said, he was a physician, but he was interested in investing in his portfolio. I remember as a kid, he got Forbes and Value Line, which I read at some point in the early 70s, pre-CBOE, he had a broker who got him interested in in options and selling over-the-counter calls on stocks he might own or um, selling puts on stocks he might want to buy. So I was introduced to, to options when, when, when I was in high school and as I learned a little more math, I was interested in thinking about how they should be priced. And there were a number of things that I found interesting. It was just sort of obvious to me that being long a stock and short a call was mathematically equivalent to being short a put. And yet the broker said that puts and calls were opposites. That was clearly wrong. A strategy of uh, covered rights, you know, owning a stock and selling calls, that was considered a low risk strategy, lower risk than just owning stock. But selling naked puts, which was to be was the exact same thing, that was considered a high risk strategy. So widespread conventional wisdom was just kind of obviously wrong to me. And maybe that created opportunities, but it really didn't appear that way. I kind of stumbled upon a job in 78 after graduating from college. It was kind of my plan to hang around New Haven, study some math independently, and go to graduate school in September. My father got the name of somebody at Drexel that he handled their option trading for the firm and insisted that I talk to him. So I did. I talked to him, and he put me in touch with his friend Ron Azer at Pronto, who ended up hiring me. In order to get the job, I had to commit to staying there for a year and a half. The initial conversations had been, you know, I'm looking for something to do for the summer before graduate school. So I did. I said I'd stay for a year and a half and defer graduate school for a year, actually. So when I tried, I was going to go to Harvard. When I wrote to them and said I, I wanted to defer for a year, as a kind of complete shock to me, I didn't think people really did this. They said, no, they said, if you don't show up in September, there isn't a spot for you. If Drexel had hired me, I would have seen the sort of politics there. I wouldn't have made any money. I would have seen sort of my boss kind of fighting to make money. And in September, I, I'm sorry, I committed for a year and a half, but I can't do it. Goodbye. Because Gronto had hired me, you know, actually we had a very independent group. I got a percentage of profits. I had paid incredibly well. It was fun. And so my career as an academic uh, mathematician ended a couple months before it started. One of the things I saw in your very refreshing book, Panic, written about the financial crisis, is you reference some periods of other elevated volatility. One is long-term capital in 98 and also the crash of 87. Were you trading listed options and and running a book of volatility over that time period, 1987? In 87, I was a market maker on the CBOE. I actually, I think of markets as more biology than physics. There's an ecosystem, a financial system is an ecosystem and they're different niches and a web of relationships, some symbiotic, most symbiotic, some predatory, but there's an institutional structure and a whole ecosystem. One of the things, I think the introduction of back index futures really changed the ecosystem. I remember 78, 79, as a market monitor, we'd have ticks. 
the difference between the number of stocks on upticks versus the number of stocks on downticks. And pre-stock index futures, plus or minus four or 500 was a very large number. Never got above 500. And that was kind of rare. When stock index futures were introduced routinely, it changed the market from being the old cliche, you know, a market of stocks instead of a stock market. The introduction of stock index futures dramatically increased correlation. The market was one stock. Futures really, really led the market. And you'd go from plus 500 ticks to minus 500 ticks or even bigger numbers quickly with the introduction of portfolio insurance, which made the broker dealers sure to put that nobody else really felt that they were long and the enhanced correlation. That to me made the possibility of something like a 20% drop more or less instantaneously fairly likely. Let me ask you this, just because I find the 87 crash, I was in college at the time and I focused my senior thesis on the 87 crash. I found it to be so fascinating to see what had occurred. And I'm curious just around the conversation in markets among folks like you who understand the complexities, this whole notion of portfolio insurance and the the way you phrase that folks were sure to put that no one else was viewed as long. Was that a theme in the market, this idea that this Leland O'Brien Rubenstein, the strategy of portfolio insurance that had had significant take up. My understanding is there were a lot of people using it among the Fortune 500 companies and that the markets just might not be fully able to absorb the potential selling pressure. Was it something that was talked about or did this in some ways just kind of come out of nowhere? I don't think it was particularly talked about. One of the things I mentioned earlier is what a stickler my high school math teacher was about making assumptions explicit and so forth. And so if you look, people knew, had to know that all the assumptions behind Black Shoals and on which sort of portfolio insurance was, was derived, that they weren't strictly speaking true. Nobody really cared. It was more physics than math. Sort of, there's a formula for more or less all papers in finance. Say, if you assume this, then you can conclude that. And peer-reviewed finance journal, the logic is going to be correct. The reasoning is going to be correct. It's going to be a mathematically accurate paper. But where it breaks down is we know the assumptions aren't quite true. But then, so the next step is if you have almost this, you should have almost that without kind of defining what almost means on both sides of the equation. And I don't think anybody, it wasn't sort of the common framework of mind to sort of look for errors or look for where the assumptions break down because sort of in most cases almost works and very broadly speaking the models can provide useful information until they're corrupted the um, the risk models something like var works quite well on a randomly constructed portfolio but if your portfolio is constructed to minimize var then you get concentration of error it seems like one of the themes that you I've seen in some of what you've written espouse is just insofar as things like VAR are concerned, that you can't just solve a mathematical formula and then interact with the environment around which the formula also operates. The presence of investors in the markets matters as well, that these aren't endogenous type of questions. Does that capture some of how you think about where are some of these models break down? Right, exactly. And the model works very, very well. A huge percentage of the universe, over 90 for sure, you know, exactly where it doesn't otherwise wouldn't be a useful model, wouldn't be widely accepted. If you look at sort of places where 
the model is pricing one thing and the market is pricing something else. In a, some of the instances, and you say, all right, I'm going with the model instead of the world. In that case, in some instances, the model will be right and the world will be wrong. But in a lot of others, you know, the world will be right and the model will be wrong. And instead of the model working 90% of the universe, maybe the model works on 50% of the universe or even less. You've just, you've sort of identified, if you focus on where the world and the model disagree, the model's going to be right considerably less than the 95, 97, 98% of the times that it's right for the universe as a whole, just by the way you've selected your universe. With respect to option positioning around the 87 crash and the maybe understanding that markets can move down with a force that the normal distribution can't possibly capture. What did you see in that period in terms of the ways in which the market perhaps repriced the vol surface in the aftermath of the crisis or of the crash, I should say? Well, skew was introduced permanently and became part of the conversation. I think that autoregressive kind of volatility models came into play. I don't know that I found any of that interesting or exploitable. Tell us about the early days of your your venture into the hedge fund universe. So you founded not just one, but two highly successful hedge funds. And of course, you've, you're doing some interesting things in financial services now as well that we'll touch upon. But I'm just, I'm curious about you branching out on your own and actually establishing independent trading firms. Can you tell us a little bit about your founding of, of those firms? Sure. What became Deep Haven was not my idea. It was um, Ruf Kessler's and Danny Asher's idea. They were friends of mine on the CBOE, and their firm was the designated primary, what was called the DPM, the designated primary market maker for um, a number of stocks that in the early 90s had issued what were called perks or decks for some preferred equity, something, something. The thing about a perk, a perk was a single security covered right. It was the equivalent of buying stock and, and selling a call. They were issued because there were many institutions that they could buy that security, but they couldn't buy stock and sell calls. So it was an option, a security with some option features and optionality that was being marketed to institutional investors. The CBOE was a very retail-oriented exchange, and you could exploit the opportunities the CBOE presented and offered as with a fairly limited amount of capital, a million dollars or a few million dollars, and you couldn't really employ multiples of that. With the advent, when Danny and Irv saw these option products being marketed to an institutional audience, they thought that They had the idea that that could be the basis for a money management hedge fund business and and that we would have some skills and some aptitude and some knowledge that we could do a good job of it. They they asked me to run it. So while I was an original partner, they were more the founders than I was. The portfolio changed and we, we ran it for two years a kind of dry run with our money and some solicited partners. The portfolio moved fairly quickly from um, perks and decks to convertible bonds, which again, sort of a product market for an institutional audience. And once again, my approach was not to try and build view of the world, a model of the world that was right, but to look for exploitable error. And the first thing that occurred to me was that if you look at the standard convertible model, it says, all right, there's a fixed income piece and there's an option piece. So we're going to do evaluation of the fixed income piece. We're going to do evaluation of the option piece. When you're valuing the fixed income piece, you make the assumption that there's some probability of default. Otherwise, just yield what treasury yield. When you evaluate the value of the option piece, you make the opposite assumption. The standard option model companies never default. 
So again, from my eighth grade math teacher, I knew that that, that was a problem making sort of the opposite assumption for, within the same model didn't make any sense. I played with that and I created some devices that helped me look at how um, how the credit curve should change with changes in equity, the, the underlying equity prices and the results you got if you played with convertibles um, a little differently. That was the insight behind um, Deephaven. White, we split up in the aftermath of the demise of, of long-term capital in 98. I started White Box. More explicitly, White Box was built on an extension of the convertible idea um, that looking at how um, the credit, the relationship between credit and equity and how um, they should move. And really, White Box was mostly about long debt. Where was long debt, short, short equity, a good trade? One of the, you know, I don't know, interesting things, but circling back, to something I, I said earlier, the broker that said puts and calls were opposites and that seemed wrong. That ties very directly in that um, you can think of a bond as um, a covered right as being long, long the enterprise value and short a call at the value of the debt and can do put and call kinds of calculations and how much credit premium, how much sort of how much extra in yield you should get for being long a bond isn't so much or exclusively a function of what the left tail of the distribution looks like, but the right tail does too, because that's what you're giving up in owning the bond, like sort of the fatter the right tail, the more you should be paid for, for giving that up. And in fact, you know, like the best long bond, where long bond short stock is most apt to work is when the right tail of the, it's not that the left tail of the distribution is, is truncated, but the right tail of the distribution is truncated. So you can be short more stock because what you're giving up on the bond side. That's really interesting. And maybe just to go back for a moment to the convert side, my understanding is the convert market, let's just say in its infancy, and really as the hedge fund industry started to come on the scene. A lot of the more prominent hedge funds started in convert ARB. My guess is the opportunity set was a little more obvious there. Perhaps that's just the lack of capital in the strategy. It's obviously become significantly more sponsored in terms of capital. So maybe some of the opportunities have gone away just because there's so many more eyeballs looking at pricing and lots more capital. But you seem to be pointing to observations on the modeling side. And so insofar as also cap structure arbitrage is concerned, that's another very interesting product that, at least in my experience, was we started on the sell side servicing clients that were selling CDS and either shorting stock or buying puts on names like Tyco or Adelphia, WorldCom, AOL. I mean, there was a almost unstoppable bid for what seemed like very expensive puts, but turned out, I think, to be cheap relative to the constituent credit side. Do you think in the early days of cap structure arbitrage, there was just fundamental misunderstanding of the relationship? How would you, how has that strategy evolved in terms of its opportunity set versus the early days? I don't have a good answer right on point. I think the difficulty in today's market is there are very few what I would call stressed credits, which was really the principal focus of of capital structure arbitrage. A stressed credit being something that has both a reasonable chance of deteriorating and defaulting or a chance of healing. That's the segment where both the debt and the equity have claims that will move significantly in value with changes in the enterprise value. For extremely strong credits, all the change in enterprise value is in the equity. You know, once the equity has been eliminated, 
all the change in enterprise value is the debt holders effectively own the enterprise. Stressed is where it's in between, where changes in the enterprise value sort of um, move both. Whether it's the Hanabi being more winner take all or the sort of split between companies having access to credit or not, there are very, very few sort of stressed credits. And there are fewer sort of equities with value and sponsorship that the debt markets that are in trouble. And then the, the sort of other challenge is there's not a market for a reorganized equity. There aren't the individual kind of stock pickers. So you do your bankruptcy analysis, you look at the public comps and you say, all right, if we as debt holders end up owning the company, it'll be at 50% discount to some reasonable public comps. And we'll be able to, the smoke is cleared, the process is, is cleared. We'll be able to sell it to stock pickers, equity, mutual, whoever it is, instead of at a 50% discount at a 10 or 20% discount. That's much, much harder. So I think overall, it's become a much more difficult space. Right, right. Just because I have your book in front of me, I found it actually quite differentiated from, a, I've read a lot of these books on the financial crisis. I tended to really focus on periods of disruption, not just because I'm in the derivatives markets, but because I just think there's a lot to be learned about markets based on studying the periods that when things go incredibly wrong. But your book was distinguished in the way in which you approach it. I think you spent a lot of time not just on detailing the specifics of instability through the kind of mortgage machine. You talk a lot about the kind of religion of finance, that we increasingly embraced finance as almost a religion. And we embrace this notion of the market as religion and that we surrendered in some ways in the period preceding the crisis to good old fashioned analysis and judgment, that everything became the result of solving something statistically or mathematically, and that became the security. I'm just curious as you, it's a while ago now, but as you think in the back to what you were looking at and your thought process in the period before the crisis, let's say in 2005 and six, were there aspects of how your framework has come to be that you especially leaned on in terms of understanding the potential for instability in ways that clearly a lot of folks missed? Bring to life some of your thoughts in that period before the crisis, let's say 2005 and 2006, when everything seemed great but underneath the surface was obviously a powder keg of risk. I talk a little bit about it in the book. You know, I think it was, I want to say 2005, maybe it was a little earlier, I heard New Century make a presentation at uh, an investment conference. And the thing that struck me was something like 90% of their book were cash out refis. All their data, majority of their data was on straight purchase mortgages. I thought it sort of seemed clear to me that a particularly a cash out refi at a higher rate almost has to be somebody that's desperate for money. And I remembered I'd read somewhere paper on default rates, corporate default rates as a function of use of proceeds. And by far, the highest default rates, uh, financings that are used to pay off insiders. So, you know, a financing to pay a private equity sponsor a dividend has a higher default rate than the initial leveraged transaction. And it seemed to me all of New Century's book was cash out refis, often at higher rates. So it was clearly kind of paying off the insider homeowner who sort of desperate for money. Those had to have much higher default rates than initial purchases. And also the incentives line up differently. So it did seem to me that 
eventually that a fundamental error was being made in treating a new century book the way one would think about a collection of kind of conforming mortgages or new purchase mortgages. And one of the things, again, sort of circling back, as a freshman in high school, I was in San Francisco with my father, and he thought, while we're there, I should go visit Stanford, which you know, I thought was, was silly. I was a freshman in high school, but you know, he wanted me to do that. So my older sister had a friend who was a freshman there, so I did, and she, I went to business school class, Finance 101, and Teledyne, they were talking about Teledyne and their sort of strategy, their acquisition strategy and their stock buyback strategy. And the professor was very much, you know, 10 times at least in the course of the hour. You can't create value, can't create value through finance. Can you create value by changing the color of the stock certificates? That was his, his expression. And, and that finance is basically changing the color of the stock certificates. That would have been 72. Milken, the sort of late 70s and early 80s, said that basically had the idea that finance is a form of governance, that that is a taskmaster that concentrates the mind and prevents managers from squandering money on vanity projects in that that sort of incentives and focus matter. Well, one of the things that I just find interesting, and this is where I would love to try to incorporate some of the pre-crisis observations with maybe some of the things either you see or don't see these days. But as you describe that new century, the way in which these cash out refinancings were being done, and as you say, the desperation that is implied by the manner in which they were done. These are reasonably in plain sight. You didn't have to look that hard. And yet, I want to say it's the end of 2006, even early 2007, the VIX actually went below 10. Volatility in all its shapes and forms was as cheap as, just about as cheap as we've ever seen. It depends on kind of how you measure it. But boy, options, you could buy a lot of them for not a lot of money. And so you had this real dichotomy of things that really don't seem right, as you point out, home prices skyrocketing higher, lots of household debt, leverage on leverage, and yet volatility is clearing the market at a very depressed level. I'm just curious how that comes to be from your perspective. And then maybe the next place for us to take the conversation is just in the here and now of also pretty low volatility, but incredibly low interest rates. Are there other things that we may be just staring at, but missing anyway, that the human condition just fails to, I don't know, fully appreciate areas of instability that might get tripped or put into motion? How would you maybe juxtapose the pre-crisis period with some of the things that you observe right now or the things these days that give you pause? I do think 2008 is a demarcation line between two fundamentally different eras. The time uh, from some time in the 70s, either the abrogation of Bretton Woods, or I like to say May Day, the, the ending of fixed commissions um, stocks. But sometime from the early to mid-70s to 2008 was the period of empowered individualistic capitalism, a faith in markets, a belief that more trading, more liquidity, more volume is always a good thing, and belief in the individual and the difference an individual makes between sort of a belief in history. And, it, and it's, um, it's broader than just financial markets. So you look at when I graduated from high school, the headmaster of my school made twice as much as the lowest paid teacher and 50% more than the highest paid teacher, probably, I'm guessing. Now, today, the headmaster makes five times as much as the lowest paid teacher and 
four times as much as the highest paid teacher or something like that. What happened? Well, it's the belief that the individual headmaster makes a huge difference, and it's not kind of the history of the institution, the whole uh, institutional constraints that built up in that period from 75 to 2008. On the market side, a secular trend in availability of capital to unestablished firms. So for the whole of my career from that that period, you know, I could always borrow just sort of using prime brokers. I could borrow more than was prudent at rates that almost no industrial company could match. Now it was all overnight and and, and all secured, but a secular trend for easier and cheaper. Post 2008, the era of empowered individualistic capitalism is gone. If you look at, you said you're not going to ask political questions, and, and I don't think this is hugely controversial, but if you look at the Warren Sanders side of the Democratic Party and the Trumpist side of the Republican Party, they are not pro capitalist. I would say they're anti capitalist. And they're clearly more than 50% of the electorate. And it's true sort of throughout the developed world. There was 80 plus percent consensus on free trade being a, a good idea. You know, it's way, 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 way below 50%. I think the whole regime, you talked a little bit about ultra low interest rates limiting growth, talked about sort of the soft bank phenomenon. As you've ended empowered individualistic capitalism, to me, the dynamism and the potential growth of the economy is severely limited. And you have sort of the coming due of the entitlement state. That, to me, seems to be the absolutely fundamental collision point and the risk point sort of throughout the developed world. People collectively through their interest groups have come to expect more in benefits than they're collectively willing to pay for. And growing sort of out of it isn't a possibility. So there's this you know, kind of populist underlying instability. When you step back and you look at the types of risks that might potentially be underappreciated by way of price in the markets, are there kind of macro variables that stand out to you that perhaps not in, in the glaring way that mortgage credit or just the credit system did in terms of the pre-crisis period, but are there are there variables now that you think the market just for whatever reason just doesn't properly appreciate the risks and is mispricing? I think Japan over the last 30 years is kind of my base case. That's very broadly my working model of the Western world as opposed to the crashes or many crashes we've had post and that it's much more likely that returns are just quite muted than that we have some sort of bust. One of the reasons being, you know, I don't see what event creates forced, quick, sloppy selling. Right. That's always the, when we think about vol events, it's the speed with which people need to react is often underlying some significant move in price. Right. And I've said it wasn't so much Lehman's failure as the sloppy liquidation of the trillion dollars of assets. As we kind of come to a close, I'm curious as to your stewardship of the bank that you bought. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you came to decide to do that and just your observations on the kind of evolution, I suppose, of the process of how credit is allocated in the economy. We started our conversation, we're talking about SoftBank and just this behemoth versus your comment that a lot of companies, at least historically, were started on a credit card. And despite the lowest rates in years and years, certainly 
the cost of credit for a certain segment of the population has not declined, even as we are amidst these very low interest rates. For quite a while, I said that low interest rates are bad for the economy and that low interest rates actually suppress growth. And my thought is, you look at how were low interest rates supposed to stimulate the economy. And classic economic theory is just is capital investment. You lower interest rates, companies increase capital and investment. And empirically, that hasn't happened. It isn't true. There should have been a capital spending boom. There hasn't been. You can look at the long time series of capital investment, and that hasn't happened. So the more modern interpretive uh, methodology is lowering interest rates increases the asset inflates increases asset prices and that there's a wealth effect people feel wealthier they spend more so lower interest rates work via the wealth effect i guess it used to be lower interest rates stimulated housing and car purchases and that may well probably still be true but it's a smaller part of the economy i think there's actually, instead of a wealth effect, there's a reverse wealth effect because wealthy people consider at least in part the passive income return potential of their wealth and asset prices haven't gone up quite as much as interest rates have come down. So if you have $2 million, you used to think that that could retire on that 5%, that will give you $100,000 a year. And you could live on that at, at 1%, it's $20,000 a year. So the person, if their net worth jumped from $1 million to $2 million, they actually feel poor because their passive income value went from $50,000 to $20,000. And if interest rates are zero, everybody's broke. And more generally, the distribution, the availability of low interest rates is by no means uniform. So used to be lots of businesses at the micro level were started, have been started on credit cards. Credit card interest rates haven't come down at all. And it's harder to get five, $10,000 credit lines. You cash advance and have $50,000 to start a business at the sort of small cap, mid cap level. I mean, those rates haven't come down all that much and they're probably less available. So the really low interest rate regime applies to governments and maybe a thousand companies. They're order of magnitude 10 million enterprises in the US. And it's even worse for the 9 million plus because you face the prospect of competing with somebody that has a zero cost of capital. You think about Mar was sort of distributing this. You think about them SoftBank has one $100 billion venture fund and may well not happen, but they were talking about doing another one. A $100 billion venture fund is kind of a contradiction in terms, but in terms of the dynamism of the economy, which do you think would produce more, more innovation, more growth, more dynamism, $200, $500 million funds or one $100 billion fund? And it's a theoretic thought question, but almost everybody would say the latter. Tell us a little bit about your current engagement in, in financial services and the bank that you purchased. One of the things that, again, seems sort of obvious to me, but didn't drive other people's actions. The advantages of a bank charter, the plus side of, of a bank charter are access to deposit insurance so that on the short end of the curve, one can borrow it at very close to treasury rates. And two, an extended forbearance period in the event of insolvency. You get sort of like a year, at least, that you can fund yourself, even if you might be insolvent on a market basis. And third, privileged access to the payment system. At the end of the day, transactions are settled at a bank. You know, they can be intermediated a number of times, not fully settled, but there's privileged access to the payment system. If the disadvantages are you're restricted, the assets are what you can hold as an asset. It seemed to me post-crisis 
there's a conventional wisdom that originate to sell contributed to the financial crisis, the banks originating to sell. Though they had been encouraged to do that, that was bad, that misaligned incentives. I think that conception is wrong. You came from Lehman. Lehman and Bear had the highest percentage of employee ownership of any of the major financial institutions. You know, they actually had Lehman employees had plenty, and Bear employees had plenty of skin in the game. So you know, I think that conception is wrong, but nonetheless, it is sort of universally believed, which to me means over time, banks will be encouraged. They have to sort of keep more of the stuff they originate. There will be a secular trend. You can't really see it now, but there'll be a secular trend to expanding the pool of assets that a bank can own. Post-crisis, the advantages that a bank can have, to me, seem more valuable than they were before. And the disadvantage is being mitigated. So to me, a bank charter is worth more, and they're not issuing new ones. To me, it's fundamentally better to be a bank today than it was pre-crisis. And yet, pre-crisis, banks traded at kind of two to three times book. But post-crisis, you could actually get them below a fairly conservative book. You can't anymore. Now it's more like one, three, one, five. And the sort of thought was that regulatory burden is more. You can't. Lending is harder. I, and kind of my view that there are a lot of sort of cracks in the fundamental algorithms wherein there are lots of very strong credits for people who can't and entities that can't actually get credit. And so it's great to be a bank. Two examples. If you change jobs, you do not qualify for a Fannie or Freddie, and therefore your mortgage is going to be more expensive. But clearly, not all job changes are the same. If you're an attorney and you go from one of the large, you move from one of the large law firms in a major city to another large law firm in the same city, you really haven't changed jobs. But that person's mortgage, you can charge more for that person's mortgage, a little more yearly. Or to me, generally speaking, to be bankable. A business has to have been profitable for some period of time and most of a a longer period of time. But I would say for a rapidly growing business, a week of profitability is better than three years of profitability for a cyclic business. That entity is bankable sort of way before large commercial banks will bank them. I also think from a pure, now the AAA tranches of CLOs, structured finance, numerically they're about 130 over. Pre-crisis, they were you know kind of 25 to 50 over. They're better structured. So I think they are absolutely airtight. That's a treasury. So if you can borrow 50 under and lend 130 over and leverage 10 or 15 to one, that's way better than working. That's most of the thought. When you describe the lending process for a bank or for any either holder of a debt security or or lender in some form, most of the conversation seems to go towards return of capital, i.e. evaluating the creditworthiness of the borrower. There is not much conversation around the strength of the currency that you get paid back in, i.e. at least the potential for erosion of purchasing power through inflation. And inflation is this thing that we haven't experienced for, feels like a lifetime. It's a long, long time where anyone's had to worry about it. It's As we were talking a little bit about central banks earlier, it feels like it's the opposite concern that they spend nearly all their time on is this deflationary cliff, so to speak. Any thoughts there on pricing of inflation? Is it the sort of thing that, as you'd mentioned, Elizabeth Warren and Sanders, and even the Republican side, there certainly isn't much left in terms of the 
folks that are really empowered by fiscal conservatism. It seems like there's just less and less attention paid to the risk of deficits as we see exceptionally low interest rates coexist with massive deficits like Japan. What are your thoughts on that? Is that a risk that you have to spend a lot of time on? Is it just it feels contained to you? What are your thoughts on the inflation side of things? Well, that is, I mean, if you had to highlight the thing that's out there that nobody sees, that nobody expects and so forth, it would be a jump to maybe even hyperinflation. My sort of pack and kind of the shift and like buying the bank forever, the pre-08, I spent all my time thinking about the best assets to own. And the liability side was easy. Just It was always easier, the secular trend, to be easier and cheaper to borrow money. I'm being provocative. I frequently say, you know, I don't, I don't think Warren Buffett is a great investor. I think he's a good investor, and, but he was the best borrower in the history of the planet. Now, now in buying the bank, it's the liability side. It's, I can get really, really cheap money. So... I don't have to buy the highest returning asset. A very safe asset that returns more than I'm borrowing at is good. And I think when I talk to sort of people, talking to clients or wealth advisors to talking to ordinary people, everybody should sort of focus on where can I borrow cheaply and good terms. If you have the discipline, nobody should have it. Debt. They should borrow against their house and pay off their credit cards, assuming they have the discipline not to charge off their credit cards again. And I do think it's right to be thinking about, all right, where can I borrow? How can I, whatever circumstance I'm in, what's the most privileged route to accessing capital? And can I effectively make a spread? Right. And sometimes I think that process needs to be pursued almost brick by brick in, as you say, making loans and evaluating the credits and doing so carefully rather than the maybe the blanket approach. Andy, we've covered a lot of ground here today. And I think that your insight specifically as someone that has traded through and managed capital through so many periods of dislocation and with a framework that's so informed by the price of volatility. I think I've certainly really enjoyed this conversation. I really am grateful for you making yourself available and wish you the very best in your new venture on the banking side. It sounds quite interesting to hear uh, someone with such experience in the hedge fund industry go off onto the more the banking side of things. So again, I want to thank you for being a guest here today and appreciate your time. Thank you. You've been listening to The Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. 